Well, in the United States, environmental regulations have to pass a cost-benefit analysis, which means that any regulation that uh, reduces carbon dioxide emissions has to include in that cost-benefit analysis some assessment of what the harm done by those carbon dioxide emissions would have been if the emissions were allowed. So that's what the social cost of carbon dioxide is used for. And um, clearly, if that were reduced substantially or set to zero, as some members of the uh, transition team have suggested it might be, um, that would have a profound impact on environmental regulations in the US. So the social cost of carbon dioxide depends really on, on three things, on how you think the global climate responds to carbon dioxide emissions, how much harm do you think a certain warming causes, and finally, how much weight you give to impacts on future generations compared to impacts on the present generation. All three of these things matter. Um, and if you accept the mainstream view that uh, carbon dioxide does indeed cause some global warming, if you're going to argue that nevertheless the social cost of carbon, the social cost of carbon dioxide is relatively low, this is typically the sort of lukewarmist position, which is yes, you know, carbon dioxide causes climate change, causes global warming, but no, it, it's not really worth doing anything about it because the cost is so low. You really need to do one of two things. You need to either argue that, carbon dioxide, that a warming of two or three degrees would be net harmless. And so that's a, a pretty strong position to take. It, it is actually something that was implied by one of the major integrated assessment models that was used in the calculation of the social cost of carbon. Um, but it is actually about 10 years out of date because it was discovered that there was actually a bug in the model that gave this rather counterintuitive result. And in fact, when you sort of remove the bugs, um, the, 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 the modern opinion is uh, just as you would expect intuitively, um, global warming does cause harm and it causes more harm the higher temperatures get. So people are already perceiving some harm from climate change today. And as we go from one degree of warming today to two or three degrees of warming in the future, those harms will accelerate. So I think that's, that, that's one area that, uh, that I think is, is it's difficult to argue, unless you're prepared to come out and argue that actually we're fine with two or three degrees of warming. It's very difficult to argue for a very low social cost of carbon today, unless you're prepared to argue that we don't care about impacts that happen after mid-century. So that's the other side of, of the other aspect of this calculation. Um, which is, if you, if you, because global warming takes time to happen, if you argue that we don't care what happens to the next generation or the one after that, uh, then of course you can also argue for a low social cost of carbon because you could say, well, okay, yes, it'll cause harm, but it'll cause harm to future generations, so we don't care about that. And in fact, this, this is the, the, the recent report of the National Academies uh, of Sciences um, really emphasized the need to um, modularize the calculation of the social cost of carbon, if you like, to make it clear what was climate science, what was calculation of climate impacts, and what was discounting, what was, what was your um, weight given to impacts on different generations. And I think if you separate these things out, it makes it very much harder for people to argue that the social cost of carbon should be low just as a consequence of some obscure calculation, they have to explain why, what, what, what it is that they, that, about their view of the world that allows them to adopt that position. Crucially, in a, in a paper we published uh, a few years ago, we showed that the um, equilibrium climate sensitivity, which is such a, such a controversial parameter and nobody can ever quite agree on what value it ought to have, is actually much less important for the social cost of carbon dioxide than the so-called transient climate response, uh, which is the warming we get at the time we reach uh, doubled CO2 rather than the warming we eventually equilibrate at after many centuries um, at doubled CO2 concentrations. And um, the, the transient, there's actually much higher agreement on the transient climate response than there is on the equilibrium climate sensitivity. So on this sort of 
first step in calculating the social cost of carbon, which is how the global climate responds to an injection of carbon dioxide, there's actually much higher consensus uh, than, than probably most people think. Um, and that's actually not the area where the differences emerge between different estimates of the social cost of carbon dioxide. The, the differences emerge from the uh, valuation people give to impacts. Um, for example, there are some people who argue that the US should use a social cost of carbon dioxide that doesn't consider impacts outside the US. If you stop and think about this, you realize that in that case, why shouldn't Texas use a value of social cost of carbon dioxide that doesn't value impacts outside of Texas? And it sort of rapidly unravels because, of course, Liechtenstein would then have an extremely low social cost of carbon dioxide. So, you know, th there's a sort of intellectual coherence problem with that line. But nevertheless, that is a line that's being taken. That obviously has a much bigger impact on your numerical value you give to the social cost of carbon dioxide than any um, debate about what the transient climate response is, uh, which is broadly, broadly speaking, most, most people, including the uh, climate change, uh, cri the critics of the Intergovernmental Panel of Climate Change, broadly agree on the range of uncertainty in the transient climate response.